Stevenson. This is my niece, Sarah. Sarah is going to help uh, present this evening. Uh, thank you for coming out. Uh, appreciate it. Uh, you're coming out here to hear our story. I uh, would also like to thank the Sevastopol Historical Society uh, for the work that they're doing to document uh, the history of the town of Sevastopol uh, and for allowing us to uh, come out tonight and present. Okay, so it's not just the microphone that I'm challenged with. There we go. Um, this is uh, the, the uh, uh, house at the farm uh, where Mary and I live. Farm has been in the family now for about 160 years. A uh, number of relatives here this evening uh, can trace their roots back to it. Um, if I would advance rather than turn it off. There we go. I think I have this down. Um, before we begin, there's uh, a couple of acknowledgments I'd like to make. Uh, I'd like to start out with Gordon Stevenson. Gordon is a distant relative of mine that lives in Iowa or lived in Iowa. I believe he has probably passed away now. I first met Gordon about uh, probably 25 years ago. I met Gordon when I was finishing up chores one morning and I heard the door to the barn open and uh, I looked up and there was a gray-haired gentleman standing in the door. And my first thought was, gee, the salesmen are out early this morning. <laughs> but uh, I motioned him into the barn. And as he walked up to me, he asked if I was Mark. He indicated I was. He said, I'm Gordon, Gordon Stevenson. He said, you don't know me, do you? I said, no, I'm afraid I don't. He said, I don't feel bad. I don't know you either. <laughs> Long story short, uh, Gordon knew he had relatives in Door County. He decided he was going to come up here and he was going to see if he could find some of us. Uh, he drove past the farm, saw my name on the milk sign out front, uh, decided to stop and see if we were related. So he proceeded to start asking me about Sarshal and Septimus and Lancina, all names that meant nothing to me. And I told him if he wanted to stop out, back out after lunch, my dad would be coming out. Maybe he could help. My dad was coming out uh, to help me chop hay that day. Uh, so he did. He stopped at, out at about 1 o'clock. Uh, I went out to chop hay. When I came in at 5 o'clock to do evening chores, the two of them were sitting there talking yet. I had lost all my help for the afternoon. Uh, so my initial interest in genealogy may not have had much to do with family as much as me understanding who my relatives were. So if somebody stopped and asked about them again, I wasn't going to have to give up my free help for the day. So, um, the second person is Larry Stevenson. Larry lives in Arizona. Uh, I first uh, met Larry about 20 years ago, a similar story to how I met him. He came to Door County looking for relatives. Uh, Larry, uh, about 15 years ago, the last that I did genealogy work with him, had tracked nearly a thousand people with roots back uh, to the farm that we live on today. Uh, he's done extensive work in terms of genealogy and tracking uh, back the Stevenson family. Uh, some of what we're going to present this evening is work that Larry did uh, in terms of tracking that back. And then the last person is my niece, Sarah. Uh, Sarah has done a quite a bit uh, of additional work on genealogy. Uh, the Lansing Stevenson branch of the tree, who was uh, my great grandfather, uh, as well as the Walkers, the Zettles, the Gibsons on my dad's side, uh, and the uh, Muellers and the Zellivers on my mother's side. So there's a lot of information uh, that she has presented. I got the right button. Do I get an attaboy for that? <laughs> So I'd like to start this evening in England in 1777. Uh, 1777 is a year that my great-great-great-grandfather was born, and he was born in Whitby, England, or in that uh, area. Um, I wanted to put this map up so you could just kind of see the area we came from. It's the northeastern part of England, uh, pretty much maritime. Uh, so when they finally ended up in Door County, they probably felt at home here. Uh, we don't know a real lot about John or his early years. We know that he married Mary Tomlinson Hardy or the widow Hardy. Uh, Mary had one daughter uh, from her prior marriage uh, 
that came into the family and then they had four children, including Henry, uh, who was uh, my great-great-grandfather. Uh, when I reference back this evening, I'm going to reference from my point of view uh, instead of Sarah's point of view, I know that would add a little more greatness if I did it from her standpoint, but I don't think it's necessary. So, um, And the other thing I'd like to point out is uh, this little town of Berwick up here. Uh, the name Berwick shows up as middle names uh, in some of uh, our ancestors. We've not been able to understand that connection. Uh, my dad used to say that uh, our family has a wee bit of scotch in it and he got it all. Uh, Berwick is the northernmost town in England. Over a 400 year period, that town went back and forth between being Scottish and English 12 times. So that, maybe that's where the Scotch came from, I don't know. So, um, so uh, Henry was born in 1804. Uh, he and his siblings we know were born in the Whitby area, so we believe that they lived there. Uh, he married uh, Mary Ann Sanderson, who was my great-great-grandmother. Oops, sorry. Uh, and she lived in the uh, Hull, England area. Hull also is a maritime town, uh, river coming in. Uh, they, uh, uh, there was a quote that came from Henry Stevenson. He had written uh, for the advocate at one point. Uh, we don't really know why they came to the U.S., but uh, he's quoted on the bottom there mentioning uh, free speech, uh, free air, uh, and being able to worship God uh, as best suits. Uh, probably those are the reasons uh, that they came to the U.S. Um, the, I should go back for just a moment. The information on this slide uh, came from a family tree that was in a Bible that Mary Ann Sanderson carried to the U.S. when she came over. It can be very difficult to gather information the further back you go. We're fortunate that uh, that piece of paper existed to be able to uh, track back. Um, Henry and his family came uh, to America aboard the Wolga in uh, 1834. Uh, we believe they settled in Canada. Uh, there's some evidence that they did. Uh, for a long time, I always thought that they probably settled up in this region somewhere. But looking at the map, New York City is down here, which is where the Wolga came in. The passenger manifest clearly states that. Uh, my belief is they probably from here emigrated up to the uh, Lake Ontario region, uh, eventually settling in East Bloomfield, New York, and they lived in East Bloomfield for 20 years before uh, 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 moving to Door County. Uh, and you can see a description there on the bottom of East Bloomfield. Uh, it's interesting, it's a hop grow uh, area that grows a lot of hops, a lot of grapes. Uh, and uh, um, so he probably felt right at home when they got here. This is a journey uh, that was documented that one of his sons had taken, and it's likely the same journey uh, that the family took to get here. Uh, overland by stagecoach uh, from uh, the area where they lived in uh, East Bloomfield, uh, Canadaiga, up into Collinswood, uh, Canada. From there, took a steamer across down to Sheboygan, uh, from Sheboygan, again, took a stagecoach across to Fond du Lac, uh, took another boat up to Menasha. From Menasha, hired a team and took them to Green Bay, and from Green Bay, uh, uh, hired another boat to bring them up and sail them to. That entire trip took two weeks to get from an area that would take us uh, uh, certainly less than a day today if we were uh, to traverse it. And they made that trip with a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old in tow. So um, they, they were pretty brave. So what's the connection to Door County? We believe the connection to Door County is actually Henry's oldest son, John B. Uh, the 1850 census shows John B. Uh, living uh, in uh, the town of Washington, Brown County, Wisconsin. Uh, at that time, Door County was still a part of Brown County and Washington, town of Washington had been set up, uh, set off Washington Island, uh, a couple of the other islands up there make up the town of Washington. Uh, and he was listed as a sailor. 
he's also the first owner of the farm. Uh, I took a little shot here of the abstract uh, for the property, and you can see that John Stevenson, uh, John B., was the first owner. Uh, he paid a grand total of $80 for that farm, and at the time it was 160 acres. I wish he'd have bought more. <laughs> um, uh, there's some records uh, in the newspapers that uh, John B., uh, A.W. Lawrence, and Jesse Birmingham, uh, and six others moved uh, or took a trip to Menasha uh, for the purpose of securing patents on the land that they moved out. And that group is the first group that settled in the town of Sebastopol, moved out and uh, started breaking ground. Uh, so John uh, homesteaded in 1855, Robert and Septimus, two of his brothers, arrived in 1856. His brother Henry and his family arrived a little later in 1856. And then Henry Sr., the dad, and the two youngest children, and Henry's wife uh, came to uh, Door County uh, in 1857. Um, this is the original uh, area that uh, was homesteaded. Uh, I know some of you know where I live. Uh, we live just up the road from the Mill Supper Club, right up on top of the hill. I was going to put a picture in here of the house where half of it was tore off seven years ago. I thought that'd probably be a good landmark that people would remember, but uh, I did not put it in. Um, so that was the land that John B. originally homesteaded. Uh, Henry, when he came, homesteaded this piece of property. This piece of property is right up on the corner where Dorothy Berg lives. She was right in behind Dorothy. That's part of Lucas Long's farm now, I believe. Uh, and Don, uh, you recall you said from when you shook cherries uh, where there was a foundation and where those buildings may have been. Is that true? Homestead. Homestead. Interesting. Um, I made a little error when I made this map, and I added this piece in uh, this, if uh, you rec remember Art Stevenson, this is a land where Art lived. I knew that Art was Henry B.'s grandson, and I made the assumption that uh, that was all part of the original farm. It was not, so you can disregard uh, uh, that being on there for now. It does come into play a little bit later. The other thing I wanted to point out, the original buildings were on the back end of that farm. Uh, they weren't on the highway uh, down where Highway 57 goes through now. That spot is one of my favorite spots on the farm. Uh, my dad said he used to, when he would plow back there, bring up pieces of foundation, so he had an idea where those buildings were. Uh, but if you go back to that uh, spot, uh, and you stand and you look, you can see right into Sturgeon Bay, and you're looking pretty much right down Highway 57. Uh, there's talk in the newspaper archives about uh, Henry and Henry B. Uh, carving the road out the Institute. Uh, I've often wondered why Highway 57 goes through the middle, oops, I'm sorry, goes through the middle of uh, uh, this section middle of section 27, roads normally run on the edge. I suspect the reason for that is uh, Henry lived here, Henry B lived here, and if you're cutting the woods, you probably cut the road between your two farms to get through, and eventually that turns into the road would be my guess. So making an assumption there. Um, uh, so Henry Sr. and his family moved to Door County 1857. They lived here for 18 years. Uh, Henry's obituary lists him as one of the first settlers in Sevastopol. Sadly, his wife Mary Ann arrived in July and passed away uh, in, I believe, October of that year. Uh, she only lived in Door County for three months. In 1860, Henry married uh, the widow Sarah Martha Wilson here in uh, Door County, and she preceded him in death in 73. Uh, the late 1850s and 1860s were pretty turbulent times for Henry. Uh, aside from picking his family up and moving them a considerable distance a second time, uh, um, he got to Door County and then moved out into the town of Sevastopol, which was basically wilderness at that point, uh, began hacking a home in the woods. 
Uh, and then the Civil War broke out, and he ended up with five of his sons going into the war. Uh, four of them fought for the North, one fought for the South, and that only left he and his son Henry to care for the farms and the family up here in Door County. Uh, I printed this out, it's Henry's obituary. Uh, what I find interesting is this middle line that I have highlighted. Uh, if you notice here, it says that uh, he lost his first wife, the mother of five boys. There's six boys up here. And what I suspect is that was not an error, that the son that fought for the South had been so thoroughly disowned at that point that he was not even recognized in his uh, dad's mm -hmm. obituary. So sad that he was the one that uh, homesteaded the farm and then eventually was uh, pretty much cut out of the family. And then I highlighted the end of this because uh, I'm sure Henry would have been very happy to know that the people uh, in the town of Sevastopol remembered him in a very positive way like that. And I'm going to ask Sarah to uh, give my voice a break. And I'm closer to the microphone than you. Okay, we'll see if I know how to work this thing. Okay, so the oldest son was John B. And what I'm going to do here is take an opportunity to discuss four of the sons who are pretty interesting, but didn't have the largest impact on Sevastopol in the county, either because they moved away um, or for other reasons. And then we're going to go back to the two um, that were here and had the farms and had a larger impact. So that's how we structured it. Uh, so we have mentioned John B. He was five years old when they came over on the ship Wolga, so I'm imagining for a five-year-old that was a grand adventure and might be part of the reason he ended up being a sailor. They came from a maritime area. He went on a big boat when he was five. He was a sailor as far as we knew when he left here and we lost touch. Uh, we don't know if he was ever married, don't know if he had children. We have had multiple people in the family research this person and tried and tried and tried to find any indication of where he might be, and we can't. <laughs> so this is my big white whale. If any of you find anything on this guy, call me. OK, so um, that's John. Next up, we have Robert. And he was born in Yorkshire. He was married and ended up having several children. And in his younger days, he actually started up the firm of Robert Stevenson and Henry Schuyler from uh, 66 to 70. So they, they started out as a meat market. It was a little touch and go in the beginning. It eventually morphed into a dry goods store and it was right down across from the Cedar Street house. So they were right downtown. That firm dissolved in 1870, uh, but they had also built a steamboat wharf at the foot of Spruce Street. And the last vestiges of that wharf apparently were not taken out until 1905, so it did last for a while. And then there's also an article in the Advocate saying that at a time when wood is, was in very short supply, maybe during the war, uh, people could actually go down and get the beams that had been sunk in the bay and haul them up and use them for wood. I thought it was pretty interesting. Um, but unfortunately, Robert moved his family to the Appleton area in 1872, and then most of his adult life, raising his children, et cetera, occurred in that area. And I get a lot of my information from The Advocate. I love the people who put that online. Uh, and unfortunately, the Appleton papers haven't been posted online um, significantly until recently. So I don't have a lot of stories about Robert and his family, uh, but that's on my to-do list. And then they did move back to Sturgeon Bay in 1900, so they did retire and come back here and um, were well received, according to the papers. Next up is Sarshall, and I consider Sarshall kind of uh, the sympathetic hard luck story. I kind of feel bad for Sarshall even 100 years later. So he um, entered the Civil War when he was only 16. He was discharged a little over a year later for uh, medical reasons. I'm not exactly sure what those were. There's some indication it might have been a heart issue. Um, but at any rate, his entire adult life, he was not particularly well. He was known for being um, somewhat sickly, I think, and it was effects from the war. Uh, because of that, though, there are some military records available that I don't have for the other brothers, and that's how I know that Sarshall had gray eyes, auburn hair, and a ruddy complexion. And I think that's totally fun because I have no pictures of him. Um, 
So when he first arrived here, he was working in the sawmills. There was an incident where a chain jumped off one of the saws and hit him in the face, and so that was pretty traumatic. Uh, most of his adult life, he was working as an engineer on the tugboats around town for Latham and Smith and other outfits. Um, one time he jumped off the boat, sprained his ankle really bad, couldn't work then either. It's just kind of this litany of bad things happening to Sarshall. Um, in the newspaper, sometimes they call him Sarsh, so I put that in here because that seems to be what people called him. And in his early years, he was also living in Tornado. And if any of you know where Tornado is, um, you might remember that in 1871, that area burned as part of the Peshtigo fire. So he and his wife had been living in that area. His wife had lost a sister. She had burned to death in the Peshtigo fire, which must have been horribly traumatic. And then their three youngest children all died of, uh, what did they die of? I have to keep my diseases straight. Yes, dysentery. There's other diseases I have to remember later. Um, and they buried the boys, uh, th all three boys, within a week. And I can't even imagine that and what they were going through at that time. And I think shortly thereafter, they moved out of Tornado. And I can't really blame them for that. Um, so then by the time we get to the 1880s, he's still working on the tugs. And he's noted as having a very severe case of consumption, which is TB and body wasting. And they s suspected that it was hopeless, and he did, in fact, end up dying a year later. But he did sometimes go to the Milwaukee Veterans Hospital because he had other different ailments associated with his military service. And uh, so he was actually going down there to talk to a doctor about some liver complications he'd been having and ended up dying unexpectedly, um, along with the TB and everything else. And so um, luckily, they finally got around to giving him his military pension. And as you can see here, it was just shy of $3,000, which meant that at least his family wasn't destitute, although his wife did show up in the paper as getting some support for um, veterans' widows. Uh, so that was a really good thing. And I just never really found any super happy parts to Sarshall. I wish I had. I've, I've, I wanted better for Sarshall. Um, and then, to turn the page, we have Septimus, who I can't find anything bad about. <laughs> There's a reason I put them next to each other in the presentation. Uh, so Septimus is, we could just call him a jack of all trades. The newspaper tended to call him Sept. I think he was really well known around town. Uh, so he was born in New York, came here when he was little. Um, he had several children. Some of them ended up in Iowa. Uh, eventually, three, at least three of his sons were in Iowa. Um, and he lived in Sturgeon Bay. So some of the stories about Sept are not exactly Sevastopol, but hey, he's ours. So uh, he started out with a saloon and then decided he didn't want to sell liquor at the saloon. So he kind of just eventually turned it into an ice cream parlor and then it kind of just disappeared. So I'm not sure that really worked out. So then he was the undersheriff and then he was the first elected village marshal of the village and then town of Sturgeon Bay. He was the fire warden, and then he was also the engineer that took care of the steam engine that the fire department used. And there's an article in the paper that says, on a really windy night, and it also must have been really dry, he was down at the fire station keeping the engine ready to go in case anything happened fire-wise on this really windy night, this kind of guy he was. Um, he also apparently got really sick of walking through snow, so he invented a snow plow. And if you go to the Advocate, there's a whole large commentary on how people didn't shovel their walks back then. Um, so he had a plow for the streets and the sidewalks. He was a carpenter by trade and apparently an excellent mechanic, so all of these things, it seems like, came naturally to him. So he started out doing those things. He eventually ended up traveling around um, doing carpentry on schools, the city halls, um, a number of different places around the area, even up into Michigan. And then a little further on, I'm assuming because he was starting to get a bit older, he had a um, furniture store. And as some of you might know, if you were a furniture maker back in that day, you were also an undertaker. And so he made caskets and was an undertaker and buried people. And uh, there was an incident where that building with all of his furniture in it started on fire and like there was twelve to $1,400 loss, which in the 1890s was fairly significant that he lost all of that. Uh, he eventually sold that, his wife died, and he kind of retired and he ended up spending some time in Iowa with his sons after he retired. 
So the reason that Septimus is my favorite is because of this slide. Um, I actually printed out the way that the top item was printed in the Advocate because I love the way that they wrote. So, one of these dark nights, some of the mischievous boys of this town will fall into the hands of City Marshal Stevenson and will then wish that they hadn't. Last Thursday evening, these young scamps <laughs> fastened a cord to a tree on the fence in front of Frank Ives' residence, whereby a lady was thrown violently upon the sidewalk. On the same evening, a similar trick was <laughs> practice in front of Dr. Meacham's residence, a gentleman being the victim in this case. The city is, uh, the city marshal is looking for the perpetrators of this mischief and if he collars them, they will know just how it feels in the sawdust of the calaboose. The calaboose being only one name that they had for the jail around here in those days. Uh, so the reason I like this so much is if you kind of ignore the advocate attribution there so you don't know what year it is, I would expect this would have been one of my uncles. <laughs> <laughs> He'll know who he is when he hears that. Okay, not this one. Um, and so I really like Septimus because through all of these stories and, and just all of these interactions, you kind of got a measure of the man a little bit more so than some of the others where there weren't as many stories. And so I just listed a couple of the things that happened while he was serving as the marshal. Uh, some of them pretty horrific. Uh, a man trying to take his own life, he did survive, uh, according to the account. Uh, the Bastille was another name for the jail. This John Blue character, I'd like to know more about him. Um, but the men who got stuck in the jail couldn't call for help loud enough, so they started singing and making a racket and the entire town showed up there, so that was a good story. Um, he shot uh, Emmy Lawrence's dog, two dogs actually, because there were three dogs that were fighting a lot, and they sued him and they said he was completely justified. Go Septimus. And then, um, sadly, the county jail caught fire with three prisoners in it, and one of the people didn't get out and died. And so that's another pretty tragic story, but for me, this is just an indication of what was going on at the time. Sturgeon Bay, not Sevastopol, but probably. It's, it's a good picture into the time. And then we get to Henry B and Mark is gonna take back over. There were really uh, three Stevenson brothers uh, that as you read through uh, had an impact on Door County. Uh, Septimus certainly being one of them, Henry B uh, being another. I mentioned a little bit earlier, Art Stevenson is a grandson of Henry B. There's probably some of you here that remember Art living right up the road here on top of the hill before you get to the curb. Uh, Art's, uh, uh, Henry had a, uh, Art's grandfather, Henry, uh, had uh, a lot to do uh, with the town of Sebastopol. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned the town of Berwick earlier, Henry's middle name is Berwick. Uh, we believe that John's is as well, but we have not uh, documented that. He was born in Hull, England. Uh, in, uh, he married Jane Orr in Canandaigua, uh, New York. Uh, Jane was, uh, uh, had immigrated from Ireland some years earlier when she was young. Uh, I'd just like to point out, I do not have Irish blood in me. That was one of the other branches. So, no offense to any of the Irish friends here. I just had to put that out there. Uh, after arriving in Door County in the fall of '56, uh, uh, he worked at Graham Lumber. Uh, his wife Jane ran a boarding house for lumbermen uh, to try to help make ends meet. And then uh, they bought the farm in Sebastopol uh, just around the corner as we go up the road here, the one we talked about earlier uh, that Don mentioned the uh, uh, foundation up there from the old houses. Uh, at the time that he was here in Sebastopol, uh, he served as town clerk, uh, justice of the peace, uh, postmaster, school treasurer, uh, uh, and secretary of the state branch as well. Uh, he was on the board of directors uh, at the inception of the Door County Mutual Insurance Company. Uh, quite a bit of information in the advocate if you read about it, about that insurance company, uh, the amount of money that it saved the farmers, but then other people saying that's only because we haven't had any uh, loss experiences. Uh, it's a bit of a controversy. Uh, and he was also uh, part of the People's and the Populist uh, parties. 
Oh, in, uh, I can't see the year from here, but I thought this was interesting uh, with uh, Don's comment about the foundation that he saw. I believe this is the house that uh, he was referring to. So uh, we mentioned that Henry uh, ran a post office. I'm not sure how many of you are aware, but there used to be a post office right up the road here. Uh, for eight years, Henry ran a post office out of his house. I found this map, which I thought was interesting, number one, because of the spelling of Sevastopol. Uh, but more than that, uh, here is the Molokov post office. And this is from 1878. Uh, so. Uh, this was printed uh, in 1914, so this uh, was 40 years back, would have been 74. After considerable delay, another post office been established in the town of Sevastopol. Its name is Molokov, and H.B. Stevenson blushingly wears the honor of postmaster. Eight years later, postmaster H.B. Stevenson got freed up of doing public work uh, for little or nothing and sent in his resignation. Uh, the Molokov Post Office. Nobody else wanted it, and the post office uh, was disbanded. Um, I took a look at that, and at the time that post office was started, Henry made the comment, Sevastopol has a Molokov, and a mighty Molokov it is. And I thought, so what's a Molokov? Milana, you might know, but I'm not sure the rest of us uh, do you know. Yeah. yeah? It would be what? Yep. Okay. Okay. There's another uh, use for the word Malakoff. Malakoff also refers to a stone tower that was built uh, in the harbor for protection. Anybody care to guess where that harbor, where that tower was built? It was built in Sevastopol. Uh, it was part of the uh, Crimean War, and it was part of the defenses in the Crimean War. I thought that was interesting, uh, that connection, uh, uh, just seeing the uh, two Russian connections here. Um, there's an editor's note here. I couldn't resist putting it in here. In your last issue, you want to know why in thunder you don't get items. The fact is, there is very little going on in this town to write about, any further than it is blasted cold. I think. <laughs> I think the mercury in the town, if there were any, would go down just about the same as it does in Sturgeon Bay. Uh, we have had no serious accidents from the frost uh, or any other cause that I know of, although some of the children uh, uh, did get frostbite away to school this morning. But I thought it was interesting. He then signed it respectfully. I'm not sure he was being real respectful by the tone that he wrote that. So. Uh, but I wanted to put it in there because uh, if you think about it, I'm sure living in the town of Sevastopol, when you're surrounded by woods, there's not really roads, uh, it had to be a miserable existence in the middle of January. And I believe that was written in January of 73. So I think it kind of showed through there a little bit. Um, there is an uh, article in uh, 1900, and I believe it was the advocate, the job to grade down the hill in front of H.B. Stevenson's, was not let on Saturday by the board. Uh, there were only two bids uh, in all, and that of Al Birmingham being $90. This figure was deemed to be too high, but when the board came to look over the job again, uh, they concluded to accept the offer. At that point, Mr. Birmingham declined. Uh, the only other bid was Mr. Stevenson for 100. I believe this is the hill up by Roger Balance, uh, just around the corner by Dorothy Berg. Uh, but thinking about it, you would not get a whole lot of road work done today for $90 that uh, would go, uh, not go very far. Uh, it's interesting to me to drive that highway and see the number of comments about the times that road has been cut down uh, and to think about what it must have been like to try to traverse that road uh, you know, 120 years ago. Uh, and then finally, H.B. Stevenson sold his farm and moved into the city, uh, owing to advanced age, uh, reluctantly disposed of it. Uh, and the last one I thought was interesting, we're a little out of sequence by date, but this one goes back to 1870. H.B. Uh, Stevenson Esquire, town of Sevastopol, informs us that the amount of highway tax for the 1870 levied by the board uh, totals $503. Uh, can't imagine how much road work you get done for $503 uh, 
not going to go very far. But I think it points to how much things have changed uh, since uh, their arrival in Door County uh, and beginning to settle. Louis Stevenson was Henry <coughs> B.'s uh, oldest son, uh, and I only put Louis in here because he was the father of Art Stevenson. Uh, he worked for a while as a salesman for a lumber company in Menominee, and then in 1890 he purchased the 40 acres uh, that Art ended up living on uh, where Donnie Ninus lives now. Uh, um, he married uh, Stella Felliver. They were married for 72 years. Uh, had four children that went to school here at Sebastopol. Uh, and some of you may have remember Art from when he worked at uh, Taylor Lumber. I don't want to go too much further into that. Uh, one of the problems we had putting this presentation together is as we work down the family tree and it starts spreading out, uh, there are so many people that we could have included in so much information. Uh, I told Jay and a couple others on Sunday, I went through and I pulled, uh, extracted some information that uh, Sarah had tabulated uh, on the Stevenson brothers, meaning Lansing Stevenson, Sarshall Septimus, etc. They were newspaper articles uh, that she had pulled from the archives that had been put online. I only pulled out Lansing Stevenson, and when I got done and printed it, I had 19 pages of material just on him. So it's very difficult to put this together and have any clue what would be interesting to you versus me and uh, be able to put it together. Um, and the final brother is Lansing Stevenson. We saved him to last. Lansing is my uh, great-grandfather, uh, Pat and Barb's great-grandfather, Sarah's great-great-grandfather. Um, when I read on Lansing, uh, he strikes me as an enigma. Uh, one day I want to say that I'm descended from a roustabout. The next time, I feel sorry for the guy. The next time, I almost feel like he was a hero. So we're going to put some information out there, and you can make your own decisions on Lansing. Lance was 14 years old when he came to Door County from New York. He was born in New York, uh, came to Door County. At 18, he was working in Illinois as a farmhand. It uh, was 1862. Uh, he enlisted in the Civil War. Uh, and spent the duration of the war uh, serving and then returned to Door County after the war. Uh, his father, Henry, moved off the farm in 1871, and at that point, uh, Lansing took over. Lansing was married four times. Uh, the first time he was married uh, was to Anna Gibson. Anna was from the town of Scott. Uh, one of the connections to Anna and the town of Scott is one of Anna's brothers was a bookkeeper for one of the sawmills in town here, and we believe that's likely the connection. Uh, in 1884, Anna became sick with what was termed a, termed a mental aberration, uh, and she was confined to the same, insane hospital in Oshkosh. In between, they had moved back in 1873 uh, down to the town of Scott, and they ran Henry Gibson's farm down there. I'm not entirely sure what happened to the farm up here, other than the fact there are some times where it shows up in the paper that it's for sale. But they moved back here, and then uh, it appears perhaps not too much after they came back, uh, Anna took uh, ill. Uh, and in 1885, she passed away. Uh, my grandfather, Robert, was three years old when his mother passed away. Uh, Lansing then uh, remarried in 1889. Uh, he married Miss Ella Root uh, from Bailey's Harbor. Uh, apparently, there was a little uh, uh, friendly back and forth between Egg Harbor and Sevastopol at the time because there's a reference to him joining the uh, turncoat and. Uh, how did they exactly term it, sir? I don't recall, but uh, it was good-natured ribbing in the paper that he was siding with Bailey's Harbor. Um, they were married for, I believe, less than a year. Uh, Ella was 21 years old uh, when she gave birth and died. Both her and the baby uh, passed away. Uh, two years later, uh, 1891, he married uh, Etta's twin sister, Ella, sure I have those names right. Um, and they had uh, three children uh, before she passed away. 
There's three children survived. I'm not real clear whether they had three or if they had four. Do you recall four? And one of them, did she die in childbirth too? Do you recall? I believe she's the one that had the tapeworm. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, she was ill for seven months <clears throat> during that time where uh, she was pregnant for a good part of that time. Uh, and then she came down with, I believe, the flu and uh, succumbed uh, after giving birth to the baby, and the baby died as well. So when I tell you that uh, I tend to look at Lansing, and I think that he's a roundabout, a uh, roustabout, excuse me, then I look at this and they say, well, maybe I should have a little bit of sympathy for the man. Uh, it's interesting when Anna Gibson died, uh, part of the Gibson family moved up here from Bay Settlement and helped uh, Robert with the family. Uh, when uh, Etta Root died, uh, the Roots moved down from Bailey's Harbor uh, and they uh, helped him raise the family as well. So obviously uh, would not expect that that means there was a lot of uh, bad feelings there. Uh, this picture is a picture of Anna Gibson uh, that we found that we were able to uh, uh, bring up. And then, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, uh, in 18, no, I said 99, 89, uh, he married uh, uh, Anna Christensen Jensen. Um, I mentioned that in 1873, they moved to the town of uh, Scott. Uh, as you go through the newspaper archives, uh, the farm was nearly sold several times. At one point, it looked like it was sold and over and done with. And then the deal either fell through or Robert backed out. Uh, and in 1881, they moved back uh, to Door County and settled back on the farm again. Um, in 1888, uh, he built the first cheese factory in northern Door County. Uh, the, uh, at one point the cheese was, the uh, farm, the uh, cheese factory, excuse me, uh, was up to receiving 2,000 pounds of milk a day, so there was a, quite a bit of milk coming into it. Uh, he won first place at the World's Fair uh, with his October cheese that he produced, so there must have been some pretty high, pro high quality product coming out of Door County. Uh, Door County is well suited, apparently not only for dairying, but the production of cheese as well. Uh, um, the cheese factory he appears to have run into trouble when he was selling cheese to an outfit in uh, Chicago on consignment uh, that he ended up getting paid 50 cents on the dollar after they absconded. And it uh, uh, looks like it was maybe not too long after that that the cheese factory closed. Uh, in 1901, Dr. James Gibson, uh, do you remember Lansing's first wife was Anna Gibson? Uh, I mentioned the farm was originally 160 acres. The 80 acres between us and Gazers uh, was mortgaged at that time uh, to uh, one of Anna's brothers, uh, James Gibson. And then in 1901, uh, that was turned over to him, it looks like, to satisfy the mortgage, and he sold that part of the farm off. Uh, 1901, uh, the records indicate uh, the foundation for a large barn was completed uh, with the intent of uh, building the superstructure the next year. That is the barn that stands uh, today. If you go up in the corner of that barn, uh, 1902 is etched into one of the beams up there. Um, uh, I thought this was interesting uh, relative to the road. Uh, 1905, I believe that is, uh, towns engaged in removing the big rocks and stones from alongside the Michael Moore farm uh, and dumping them in the hollow between the farms of L.R. Stevenson and Mrs. Joe Zettel. Uh, raises, will raise the roadway in due time. Uh, uh, the stones were so large that they were having to use a derrick uh, to pick them up and move them at the time, probably a big uh, uh, operation. Uh, 1905, again, a lot of work's been put in the hill opposite Lance Stevenson by the town. Uh, surplus material being deposited in the highway uh, or passes through the ravine. Um, I thought it was interesting, Sevastopol is bound to have the best roads in any town in the county, regardless of the trouble and expense. 
But then if you look at the next slide, it says 1916, so it's 11 years later, uh, where the road that was such a terror to drivers has now finally been uh, fixed up. So it probably didn't go quite as fast as they thought it was going to go in 1905. Um, this picture I found interesting. Uh, we There is a... Uh, uh, there's writing on the back of this picture that indicates to me that uh, um, the Zettles uh, and my Aunt Goldie are standing across the road from the farm, uh, just down the road from the small silo that stands near the road on my farm. Uh, when you look at this at first, you say, ah, that doesn't quite look right, but Sarah and I were upstairs in our house today and I was looking right down in that area. The rise that's down here uh, matches in the road. Uh, the road today looks like it's up in the air quite a bit. It does not look like this would be this flat. But if you look at the natural lay of the land there, uh, the flatness of that comes almost up to that silo. And I believe they're just across the road looking down. The road, the uh, writing on the back, oops, excuse me, indicates that this is uh, Joe Zettel's orchard. And you can see that looks like either cherries or apples back there, uh, probably in bloom at the time. This tree right here I find interesting because there was an ex uh, a very, very large maple tree grew on uh, uh, that fence line for many years. Uh, I remember Marty Polish cut that tree down in probably the 70s. And I look at this picture and I believe it's very likely uh, it was that same maple tree that was growing there in this picture. Um, but if you look at this road, uh, I think they had a little bit of a ways to go to get the best roads in the county. Um, I often complain about that road. Uh, in the spring, if you go by and you see the sign that says dip ahead, many people think I'm the dip. <laughs> um, so uh, those times of the year, I have a few words for uh, that part of the road. Just to clarify for everyone why that dip is in the road, when they cut that road down the last time. They came and they talked to me to purchase them right away before they did. And I asked, are you going to address those springs that are in the hill? They told me there are no springs in that hill. I said, what do you mean there's no springs in that hill? I said, the water runs right out of that hill in the spring. We did a survey, there are no springs in that hill, okay. So when they cut the hill down, they parked uh, a high hoe up. There are two high hoes side by side. They would reach down and cut into the hill and they had two big off-road dump trucks. They'd back an off-road dump truck in, one high hoe would dump from one side, the other one from the other. It would take about two scoops with each and that big dump truck was on the way. That's how fast they cut it out. Right up till the time, one of those big dump trucks hit the spring under that road and they laid that big off-road dump truck right over on its side. The middle of those trucks are hinged and they're laid. They end up taking a high hole off the hill, going around the other side, reaching over with it, picking the truck back up, getting it it's on its wheels and getting out of there. And then they took the high hole and they scraped it out and they threw a bunch of uh, breaker run underneath. So in the spring, the rest of that road has water that builds up underneath it and the road rises when it freezes. Uh, but the area that has a breaker run, there's no material to hold the water, that part of the road stays low. In the spring, when it thaws back out, everything goes right back where it was. The dip moved off the farm and life is good again. <laughs> Useless trivia, but I was putting in a plug there for the dip on the hill. So. Um, this uh, we added in we thought was interesting. I've been asked numerous times over the years if the fairground was ever uh, across the road from me or people indicated uh, they believed the fairground at one time was across the road. Uh, it was there perhaps only for a year. Uh, there was some uh, back and forth. Uh, farmers in the county had a pretty strong fair going on it looks like. Don't know exactly what happened that that kind of fell apart. Uh, but there is mention in the paper about the fair, uh, the one year being held right next to the town hall. Uh, so I believe it was likely right up on top of the hill there uh, across from the farm. And then the following year, the article about the town uh, or about uh, the county buying uh, property to move the fair to the 40 acres. Have not researched it. I expect that's likely the existing fairgrounds it mentions. It's on the uh, northeast side of town. Um, I'm going to turn this back to Sarah again. Uh, 
And so similar to Henry B. and Louis, we did include one slide, um, mostly because this is Robert, and you can see here is Robert and my grandpa Al. I had to get a picture of my grandpa Al in here. Um, and so we just wanted to highlight him because he took over the farm after Lansing. Uh, he was married to Lily Zettel, so that's how the Zettels come in. If you've seen the, the posters over here, you'll see their name on a couple of them. And they had four children, Milty, Goldie, and Sylvia, and then there was a baby George, but he died as an infant. And then Lily died suddenly in 1910 due to an acute case of cholera. She got up in the morning, was going about her chores, felt just fine, and she was dead by night. And um, she went out to the orchard, ate, ate some apples. It seemed to make it worse. Nobody knew what was wrong with her. The doctors were there. The family was there. It was pretty traumatic uh, and very unexpected. And then they ended up having her funeral on a Sunday because her body was decomposing so quickly. And it was also turning a copper color, which apparently are some indications on why they thought it was cholera. So crazy scary, how did what just happened kind of moment, I think, for the family there. And then there were small children, of course. And then in 1914, Robert married Pearl Walker. So here's where the Walkers come in. Um, and then they had nine children. So um, in the 1900s and 1910s, he was leasing the Joe Zettel farm. So he was working in the orchards, doing that type of thing. But after Lily died, um, after 1910, then he uh, at some point went back to the Stevenson farm. And much like um, his father and uncles before him, he did a lot of stuff for the town. Uh, he was on the county highway finance and poor committees. He was the Sevastopol town chairman for several years. He was also the assessor. He was a director for the Peninsula Farm Loan Association. He was a census taker in 1940, so when I'm cursing the band, bad handwriting in the 1940 census, I might have to temper it for Sevastopol. And then um, he was also a member of the County Farm Security Advisory Committee, so he was very much concerned about farmers and their welfare uh, around the county. He was pretty active in politics. Uh, he attended the 1934 State Democratic Convention, and. He went up to the Twin Cities to meet with the Secretary of Ag in 1940. So that's all pretty interesting. Unfortunately, he died unexpectedly in a car accident on the hill right out in front of the farm. Um, he was turning into the farm. Back then, all the, the cars had clutches. Something went wrong. Someone came over the hill, um, hit the car, and he died. So that, that cut short uh, a man who seemed to be doing a lot of good in the community. And then that's all of the brothers that we've covered. So now we just want to highlight a couple of uh, additional items, one of which is the military service. Um, and we just wanted to point out kind of the story of how the four and five brothers ended up um, making it through the Civil War. Sarshall was the first to enlist at age 16. He went in first. He was discharged due to the disability in 1863. So then we see that Lansing had enlisted in 1862, so he was um, somewhat early, the same that Sarshall was. He was taken prisoner during the Battle of Stones River and sent to Libby Prison. He was released in a prisoner exchange and he eventually rejoined his unit. Um, he dropped a lot of weight, which I think is consistent with things that I've heard about the horrors of Libby Prison. And then after rejoining his unit, he fought in the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain against his brother John. <laughs> the plot thickens. Uh, so we'll get back to that in a minute. And then we just want to note that Robert and Septimus both enlisted in 1863, uh, which was shortly after Sarshall had come out due to the disability. And so it's kind of interesting how the brothers ended up going in the timing, and uh, they were all in different units. They didn't fight together. Septimus was actually out west. And so when we think back to the stories about Sarshall and Septimus, Sarshall had a discharge due to disability. Septimus was out west in Kansas, and um, we have a journal that he kept courtesy of uh, the Polster family, and it's really pretty boring. Um, a lot of very routine days, which was good for Septimus. He lived a long life and he didn't come out with too many bad effects, but you can kind of see when you compare Septimus and Sarshall how the Civil War affected their lives. 
Oh, and that picture is Septimus. So then, what about that guy, John, who is fighting for the Confederacy? How did that happen? So he was sailing on Lake Pontchartrain and avoided having to fight in the war for some time, but then eventually was conscripted. So it sounds like it was against his will, but it's hard to know. Uh, so we just have some information here about how Lansing was injured and the injuries from being shot is what led to him being captured and put in Libby Prison. But Libby Prison is where he met up with his brother John, so the, the story is that they actually saw each other there and were able to talk to each other. Um, uh, the family lore is that he asked if he could come back to Wisconsin and he was told not to. And so somebody came around asking, and then this, this is another Advocate article, whatever happened to John? And um, they said that they were on opposite sides, they were probably trying to shoot each other. And that um, it seems kind of coincidental that John, who they call Jack in this article, he was in the South, it was a bad situation, but it seems like it turned really bad when the, you know, the family didn't accept him. And this is probably in large part where we can't find anything about him. That and the fact that John Stevenson has got to be the most popular name on record. So I just have to say that in trying to find John Stevenson, I thought, hey, Septimus, that's a weird name. I'm gonna go back to England and search for Septimus and Sarshall. Do you know how many Septimus Stevensons there are in Yorkshire in the 1870s? <laughs> Double digits. <laughs> Who knew? Anyway, so this is just kind of closing the loop on John um, and why we don't know a lot about him. Before uh, you move on, can yeah. you comment or could yeah. you go back to that? <clears throat> I'd just like to comment uh, to that first article uh, where it talks about uh, that shell fragment striking him in the right jaw, running him insensible. Uh, when he recovered consciousness, the rebels uh, had control of the field, uh, captured him and imprisoned him. Um, I've been accused over the years of being stubborn and I've always told people I am not stubborn, I am strong-willed. But I just wanted to point out, if it were not for the hard-headed nature of the Stevenson males, there are many of us here would not be here today. So. And I want to point out, I want to point out that your sister's laughing at that. Thanks, Jack. Uh, so while we were on military service, we just wanted to kind of put a general thank you. There are a lot of people in the family. These are just pictures that I happen to have of some that were in their uniforms. We're not trying to limit to these folks. Uh, we have Archie and some unidentified person in the first picture. Does anybody know who that is? Is it? Okay, I'm going to put Uncle Bob on that. Uh, and then we have Kenneth who died during World War II. And then the picture on the right is uh, Henry and Lloyd Walker. They were Pearl's brothers fought in World War I. One of them was killed and one came home, yep. And then we just wanted to do one other tribute. Um, those of you who do genealogy research know that it's very heavily biased towards men because men were how things followed through, uh, through our society. And we just wanted to acknowledge that the women had a really big impact. There were a lot of effects. They struggled along with the men. Um, a lot of women died pretty early. Anna Gibson, we have already talked about. Um, Etta and Ella Root, um, very young in their 20s. And Lily Zettel, of course, also in her 20s. And so we just want to acknowledge that the women had a really big part to play in the family. It's just that they don't always show up in the records. And so we wanted to pay tribute to that as well. Questions and discussion? That's it. Well, that's not all there is, but that's all that fits in an hour. We hit it on the dot. Nice job.
I'm going to give Bill and Carolyn a free pass back. made for our family reunion uh, this past summer. Uh, we used to have family reunions probably every three to five years. Uh, we've narrowed that up uh, in the last uh, probably six or eight years. We're having them every two years now uh, because frankly, uh, we're getting to an age where uh, the uh, uh, the people dwindle if you wait too long in between. Uh, each year I wait and that we have it. Uh, I say this is the year where I'm going to end up with all kinds of food and nobody's going to show up to eat it. Uh, we had horrible weather for it uh, this year and we still ended up with over 80 people showing up. So we have a very good turnout. Uh, appreciate everyone showing up. And the customer. <laughs> so, so do you have older pictures of like the farm and families and stuff? We have pictures, uh, more pictures of people than we do of the property. Uh, so when did that, you said this isn't the original barn, when did the original barn burn then? I believe it was in the 1880s when that barn burned. Oh, that was pretty early then. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, this barn was built in 1901. In between, the cheese factory went up. Uh, my Aunt Arlene, before she passed away, told me she remembered the foundations of that building. Uh, the building sat right by the road. Uh, those of you that remember that little stone uh, pump house that was there, it was kind of to the uh, east, maybe southeast uh, of that building, uh, is what I've been told. Uh, when uh, the state came through and cut the road down the last time they took that uh, stone pump house down, uh, we did pull up a piece of pipe uh, that ran from that uh, pump house underground over to that area where she told me that building was. So I believe that uh, that's a little bit so. I don't remember that building at all. There was another building on that farm, uh, kind of where the red metal machine shed was, uh, just right to the south of that. Uh, I remember the foundation of that building being there. Uh, I don't remember the building at all, but I have seen pictures. Uh, we do have one building that has that picture. I'd love to have a picture uh, looking up that hill from down the road. I'd love to find a picture that had that cheese factory in it and the old uh, uh, pump house in the barn. But, uh, and when do you think the cheese factory was done? Uh, 1874. Why is it? <laughs> <laughs> we complain about that 
stoplight down there now. It doesn't sound like it was any better back then. No. <laughs> it was more fun though. <laughs>
Uh, I can remember when I was young, uh, just to the west uh, of the barn, uh, near the road, uh, there was a piece of pipe stuck on the ground there for years, and it was an old well that the pea miners used to pull in and use the water out of it when they were uh, uh, finding the peas. And peas were a big, mm -hmm. big crop that they were going. And they kept planting over and over, and it, it, it didn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. There are several articles in the application. There are several articles in the advocate where the very early people were trying the grains and they had too many failures too early and when they really figured out that the land here was not suited to that, they started changing the dairy, but our family happened to be one of the earlier ones. Okay. <coughs> Years back, my dad worked for Rattles, our Bay Rattles, uh, orchards, and they were so shallow, it was not there, they just went down a half a stick of dynamite, of course, a little hole there. Cherry tree right in the stone, and my dad's claims that's why it tastes because of the lights. That uh, land next to me in the back corner uh, was stolen. I smiled when we talked about the dynamite. Because around about 6 feet across and probably 10 feet long, I guess, and right in the middle of the field. Our daughter used to go out there and she used to call that her secret rock. I don't know how else to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> the, the, the story is that uh, they wanted that rock out of the field. So my dad's uncle Tom went over to the little shack over at Reynolds and he stole some dynamite out of the shack and pulled that rock. In. And they took it back and they put it under the rock and somebody says, no, wait a minute. You blow that thing up, who's picking up all the pieces? So they hold the dynamite up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm going to go We do have uh, the family trees. As I started to say, this is a walker tree that Sarah put together. Sarah has done extensive uh, genealogy work. Uh, we had that one for the family reunion this year. Uh, these two are Stevenson family trees. Uh, it was too popular to put it all in one. We ended up breaking it down into two. Uh, we have an old picture of the farm here, a uh, t-shirt that we put together from one of the family reunions here. Um, uh, when did you put that together, Lori? It was 100 years, right? So, no. It was 2005. So it was a year different. What year? 2006. Whatever it was. Uh, and then we have uh, the Sussex Centennial Plan uh, plaque. Uh, Mary and I went down to the state fair, uh, what would you say, Mary, 10 years ago maybe. And uh, we had registered and uh, received that uh, 150 plus years of continuous ownership. And then we brought in this ledger, uh, proceedings of the district board uh, that. Uh, school board. School board. Uh, either my grandfather or great grandfather were on such a thing that interesting. Again, thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, appreciate your showing the interest and uh, hope you enjoyed what we have to say. Thank you. Thank you.